Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to turn back the clock and feel more youthful than ever before, or even close, then do we have the 30 Summers More show for you. Today I'll be talking with Dwayne J. Clark, philanthropist, playwright, producer, co-founder and CEO of Aegis Living, and the author of a brilliant book for rolling back your life, 30 Summers More. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, how to get younger at any age and have 30 summers more or many more than that. That plus we'll talk about Cary Grant and doctor's visits, grandma's childhood and the sweet story, fire brain at night, the laughing Buddha master standing on one leg while brushing your teeth and what in the world frozen waffles have to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Dwayne. Are you ready to shine? I'm ready to shine, Michael. Let's do this. Woohoo! All right. <laughs> Before we dive right into things, where'd you grow up? What was your environment like? Well, I grew up in rural Idaho. My mom, uh, my mom was a British citizen, raised in India. Her yeah. her dad was an executive in the uh, in the Brit in the Indian Railroad in, in in during the World War II. And my mom met uh, my dad was an American GI. Yeah. And uh, he put her on the boat in the mid 1940s and said, "Hey, you're moving to Idaho." So she left her entire family and uh, moved to America, which she'd never seen before, and grew up. I was the youngest of four children. I was kind of the oops kid. That uh, I have a brother that's 12 years older, a sister 10 and a half years older, and, a, and another sister almost eight years older. So that's that's why I'm the oops kid. And uh, grew up on a ranch in Idaho and. Uh, had had kind of a difficult upbringing. My dad was not a nice person. He was abusive, physically abusive, mentally abusive to my mom and to my siblings. And when I was about seven years old, he kind of disappeared. And uh, and yet, you know, despite that uh, that difficult upbringing, I think it's probably some of the best education that that I've ever had in my life. In fact. Uh, a mentor and a dear friend of mine that many of your listeners may recognize, Dr. Wayne Dyer, who passed away a few years ago, used to tell me I had the luckiest upbringing in the world. And I would say, Wayne, what are you talking about? You're crazy. He's like, no, your dad taught you how to parent in reverse. And so, mm -hmm. you know, because because of how my dad treated my my family, I, I think I became an incredible father and a great husband. So you think in essence, it, you boomeranged back to the care and compassion, the kindness side of things. Well, I think you just start to discover what's really important in life. And, you know, when we have great family environments, you know, sometimes I think people take them for granted and, and they're not as precious. And when you don't have that, you have and all of a sudden you experience it, you go, oh, wow, this is profound. This is this is really incredible. Thank you. So I'm, I'm looking behind you at all sorts of sports memorabilia. I can't believe yeah. you have a Muhammad Ali glove behind you. And, Absolutely. And it can't help me thinking about two things. One the work ethic that your mother must have installed in you, and two, your race to get to a, better is not the right word, but a, a, a race to produce, would that be a good way to describe it? Yeah, I think, you know, people talk a lot about my background because it was, it was impoverished. And I, I don't mean like, hey, we were poor, we didn't have the nicest house on the block, we didn't have a house. Uh, you know, we, we went from apartment to rental house to, you know, back and forth. We were never homeless, but, uh, we were certainly impoverished and there were times where we didn't have food to eat. But yet I, I, I tell people I would, I wouldn't trade that upbringing to go to B school at Wharton at all, because when you have poverty in your life, um, you have two choices, right? You can, you can say, Oh, poor me. I, I, you know, I have all these, th these bad breaks in my life, you know, my life is miserable. Or what I choose to do is say, hey, man, this is rocket fuel. I know what this is like, and I don't really like it. And so this is going to light my tail end on fire. And I'm going to run from poverty as fast and as far as I possibly can. And that that's, that's what I choose to do. And I mentor a lot of young kids who are in similar situations to me. And that's why I say, I mean, you got two choices here. You can say, poor me, or you can say, man, I got a dose of rocket fuel that's really going to help me in life. Awesome. Woohoo! So <laughs> you took that rocket fuel, and what were your dreams going up? Where did you want to point? Did you have any idea where you wanted to point the rocket? Well, I, I thought, 
you know, I, I was influenced. I was a kid in the 60s and 70s that was influenced by a lot of popular television, you know, which was my babysitter. So, you know, I watched the, the detective shows, the Perry Masons, the, the Kojaks, the, the Dragnet, you know. So I thought my bent was towards law enforcement. And, and then, you know, when I started looking at what policemen had to go through, I thought, well, I think I'm going to be a criminal defense attorney. That's really what I want to do. And so uh, my junior year of college, I ran out of money. And a buddy of mine said, you know, I don't really think you're meant to be a criminal defense attorney. You're too nice a guy. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hell bent on doing this. This is what I'm going to do. And he goes, well, if you run out of money, why don't you go work in a prison? And I said, what, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you know, you can make a decent living. You'll, you'll get to see your future clientele. They'll, they'll get to know you and you'll be able to say, can I deal with these people on a, a day out, day out? day in and day out business. So I went and worked at Washington State Penitentiary, which was a super max penitentiary in Walla Walla, Washington. Um, the year I went to work for there, Jean Dixon, the, the futurist, said that it was the worst prison in the United States, and she predicted 100 people would be murdered there. Um, in my first 12 months, I probably witnessed three murders. Um, and so it was horrific. It was horrific. And yet I got promoted every six months and I thought it was going to be a one to 18 month stay. It turned out to be a six year stay. And I did all kinds of crazy things from, you know, be on the tactical team to learn hostage negotiations and so on. And one day I woke up and I said, what, what, what am I doing? You know, I've been here six years. Um, and I left and my sister, I, prior to leaving, my sister said, you know, you should really get into senior housing. She was working for a state agency. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I don't know anything about old people. I know about murderers and rapists and bank robbers and all these kinds of people. She goes, this is in 1985. She said, go down to the library because we didn't have computers then. Yeah. Go down to the library. There's this study called The Grain of America. And she said, it's really earth shattering. So I went down to the library. It's like a 400 page document that, you know, you have to read through. And I came away and I said, oh, my God, this, you know, the, the planet's going to be filled with people over 75, 80 years old. And that was an epiphany for me. And that's that's when I got into aging care in, in 1985. It's, it's fascinating because I was just reading about <laughs> what's a, a future aging crisis in China because of the one word, the one child policy and right. how the society's flipping on its head. So so you're in you're in the right <laughs> you're in the right game. Now, I'm very curious. I spent a day, a half a day as part of my undergrad degree as part of a um, uh, I, I was working for the courts program and I spent a half a day in a maximum security prison as um, it was called a program called Shape Up, and I went through this day day program supposed to scare kids straight without yep. anybody knowing that I wasn't one of these kids. And right. just one day in a maximum security prison, really a couple hours, was yeah. the scariest thing I have ever experienced in my life and did profoundly change me. Yeah. How did that experience – I mean, it may be hard to separate. It was a six-year chunk of your life. But right. how did that frame life for you when you came out? Well, I, I just did a radio show uh, earlier today, and the, the guy was asking me this question. And I said, you know, I, I, I'm a businessman. My company owns two and a half, three billion dollars worth of real estate. I get into deep negotiations with people. There's all kinds of business challenges. But I'll tell you, when you have uh, 300 felons, uh, get in a riot and you're the only guy there and they're screaming they're going to rape you and kill you and take your head off, you learn a new way of negotiations. You also have a new paradigm of what fear is, of what a problem is, of how, how you get out of a tight space. And so um, there's what, the way it, 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 it really taught me was uh, it presented a paradigm of what really bad is. And, you know, I've never been in a war. Or I was never in Vietnam or World War II or Korea or anything like that. But I, I tell people this this was my war because every day that I went to work, you know, I had a young child. I'd kiss my son goodbye and I, I'd, I'd wonder, am I going to come home tonight? Um, it was that bad. And, um, you know, you you, uh, you know, you and yet these are people, these are human beings that, you know, although they've done horribly bad things. Um, they're human beings and you want to treat them with some kind of dignity and respect. So 
Um, I was I was the youngest sergeant in the state's 120 year history. Um, so I, you know, because I could walk and chew gum, promoted very quickly, and uh, and, and so I got a fair amount of respect. And you know, for, it, it, what people don't understand about a prison is there's there's a variety of demographics in a prison. You know. And it's it's very diverse. So you have a Native American population, you have a Hispanic population, you have what's called the lifer population, you have a, a biker, a large biker presentation population, um, you have an Asian population. So you have all these different groups that have very very different needs and wants. And you know, much like running a company, we, we have almost 3,000 employees. You have to have the emotional intelligence to say, how do I relate to these people and how how do I communicate with them in a way that they respect me? And, you know, I, I was in more than one very bad situation where essentially the we lost control of a maximum security prison. And then people were running wild with clubs and knives and everything else. And there were people that would actually protect me. They'd say, OK, you know you know, come, come down to this closet. We'll hide you here. and We'll put post a couple guys in front of it. When it's over, we'll knock on the door. So, you know, there, I, I think, I think when you put civility and humanity, even with the worst people in society first, um, there's a level of respect there that has huge benefits. Amazing. We could do a whole interview on this. In fact, we may have to have you back for that. Okay. Going to youth, vitality, things of this sort. You had a couple health crises. Crises, yeah. crises in your crises, life. Yeah. First one in your mid thirties. What was your scare then? Well, you know, I've, I've always been a big guy. I mean, I, I, I played football. I mean, I graduated high school at almost 240 pounds. I've never been a, a, a skinny mini guy. Um, so I've had a lot of nagging uh, issues and injuries in my life. Um, you know, high blood pressure and everything else. And when I started writing 30 summers more, I'll speak to the most recent one first. When I started writing 30 Summers More, I thought uh, I was writing this to detail the 60,000 people that I've cared for, the 60,000 elderly people. Because I was always curious is, why is the guy that's 300 pounds and five foot eight that eats bacon every morning, why is he 88 years old and still doing well? And why is the guy that's 79 and eats a watercross sandwich at, you know, at lunch every day and goes for a walk? Why did he have a heart attack and die you know, at 79? So I was always curious about this. And so I thought when I started writing this book, it would detail those stories, you know, it would explain that. About six months into the writing of the book, this is about five years ago, what happened to me was I essentially had, had an internal GI bleed and it wouldn't stop. And so, you know, it got to a point where they're going to have to do a blood transfusion and so on. And so I was in the hospital and I asked my wife, well, bring this manuscript that I'm working on. It'll give me something to do to take my mind off my problems. And I started reading it. And I thought, this, this book is not about the 60,000 people I've cared for. This book is about guys like me that are 40, 50, 60 years old that maybe just need to pay a little bit more attention to what I call the micro habits of life. And, um, you know, I, I, I was a person that, you know, I wouldn't say I was highly – attentive to my diet, but I always worked out because I'd always been an athlete. So I'd, in fact, the day before I went to the hospital, I'd, I'd done a two a day and worked out, which was probably one of the things that may have put me in the hospital. That, that I'll pause you for a brief second because there was a big thing that happened that people get to be aware of, the danger of NSAIDs. So you've exactly. been taking a bunch of ibuprofen for probably sore muscles and joints. Yeah. So I was trying to keep up with the younger staff that were probably 20 years younger than me. And I loved to lift weights and used to lift really heavy. I mean, nor north of 300 pounds on a bench press. And, you know, I was trying to keep up with these guys and I was, I was popping, you know, all of this, all these incense and, and, you know, gave me a stomach bleed. And then I ate some things uh, that were very acidic based. So, you know, that just complicates it. And then I ate some dairy that was inflammatory based. So that that blew up the balloon that had a thin wall anyway. And so, you know, all these kinds of things that you do and you're like, I didn't even realize, you know, but retracing my steps, I realized how I was actually hurting my body when I thought I was helping it. Yeah. So so going from there brings up an interesting term. And I wonder if you were at this place in your life you mentioned in the book, Karoshi. Literally overworked yes. to death. Yeah, the Japanese, the Japanese philosophy of Kuroshi that you know, you people actually work themselves to death. 
And, you know, I've, I've been to Japan. I've had uh, business dealings with Japanese people. I always think it's really fascinating. You know, uh, I'm not a drinker. I stopped drinking probably right after college. Uh, but I always thought it was fascinating how they would they would work 16 hours a day, then go out and, and drink so much. And then, you know, you have a meeting next door next day. And one of the things that's allowable in the culture is the most senior member can sleep during the meeting. So it would you know, it would be interesting. You'd, you'd have five guys in the meeting. And the most senior member would be dozing off in the meeting. So and then, you know, that's because he was the senior guy and he got that that entitlement. So but yeah, I, you know, I think. There's a machismo uh, attitude sometimes about I don't have to sleep. I, you know, I can work 16 hours a day. You know, I'm superhuman. The reality is we all have the base, the same basic biology. We, we, we all need to sleep at least seven hours a day. Um, you now, can you get away with it? Yeah, you can for certain times. But what you have to ask yourself: What kind of impact is it having on your body? Because sleep does two things. The first thing it does is it detoxifies your body of all the bad cells that you have, the things that give you cancer, things that give you dementia, things that, that give you all kinds of disease, heart disease. And so when that happens, uh, you know, you have to get rid of those dead cells some. And what happens is your, your body kind of sucks all those together, they aggregate them, and then through your lymphatic system, you're, you're able to dispel that. But it takes seven hours for the factory to work for, you, for that to happen. The other thing that happens is if you don't get seven hours sleep is the regeneration process. We're all just a bundle of cells. And your body, again, it's a factory. It needs seven hours to produce the good cells to replace those. And then, you know, so if you don't, yes, you can get up and, and, and survive on six hours sleep. I, I just got back from Europe Thursday, and I don't think I got six hours sleep for the 14 days that I was there. So I survived. I had late nights, but I, I felt like I was dying, you know. I, I'm, I need about seven hours and 15 minutes sleep to survive. But beyond that, I need good REM sleep and I need good deep sleep, which usually account for about three hours of my sleep. So every day I check that and say, okay, how much REM did I get? How much deep did I get? So, so, so since we're on the sleep topic, we'll take your book a little bit out of order, but why not? Fire brain at night. What can you tell yeah. me about that? Well, I invented that term fire brain and uh, it, it has a variety of, of, of connotations. One of the things that I changed is, you know, having worked in law enforcement prisons with criminals and stuff, I love adventure television, right? So I, I'd like watch the murder mystery or I'd watch the dateline where, oh, this husband murdered his wife and buried her, in, you know. And so at 10 o'clock at night, right before I'd go to sleep, I'd be watching these things that would just light my brain on fire, right? Stimulant. And then I'd, yeah, it's stimulant. It's, it's, it's like drinking three cups of coffee. And then my wife, my wife, who's a very soulful, peaceful person, would say, "What? Why are you watching this junk? You know, you're putting that in your brain." Mm -hmm. And then, you know, at night, what would happen is I'd be restless, and I would thinking that, you know, I was in the in the movie plot and, and going crazy. So I totally took that out of my TV diet and said, "You know, this is not going to happen anymore." And there's a lot of things that causes fire brain exercising too close to bad time to bedtime. You know, blue light from an iPad or iPhone or a television. Um, you know, I mean, stimulants, you know, people say, well, I don't drink coffee. I said, well, you eat chocolate. Oh yeah. I'd love to have a piece of chocolate before I go to bed. Well, you know, that's going to create fire brain. You're going to light yourself up because of the amount of caffeine you have in chocolate. So a lot of things that, that people don't really understand sleep out of all the things that I talk about is foundational to this book because it's what sets you up for good health. And if you don't, if you don't get it, um, and, and there's, you know, there's a lot of things in the book that talks about how you get good sleep from the quality of mattress you have, the sheets and pillows and room temperature and so on. But it's what sets you up every day to have uh, to have good health. And I would tell you, I think sleep is more essential than exercise. I couldn't agree more. And this is as someone who's been an exercise nut and been a professional athlete for the majority of my life, but one or the two. Um, sleep is... It's foundational. It's key. In fact, I'm wearing right there now, and I'm guessing you've got something like this on as well, a yeah. watch that will track your sleep so that you can see, okay, I'm getting to bed at X time. I'm getting up at Y, but am I actually getting a quality night's sleep? Yeah, that's essential. I wear this ring. It's called an aura ring. Yeah. And uh, I, I 
Prince Harry talks about it a lot, so I, I started using it. I had a Fitbit previously, but this tracks everything from my heart rate to my respirations. It lets me know if my heart's elevated at night, mm -hmm. which, which if your heart's elevated at night means you're not getting a restful deep sleep. So I like my heart rate to be during the night an average 53, 54 restful sleep. Uh, this morning, I didn't sleep that great. It was 61 average or 59 average, which is high for me. Now, you may not think, well, geez, what is that? But it's an indicator. And there's so much wearable technology now. Wearable technology is about a $30, $40 billion industry today, and it's just getting bigger and bigger. So quality of sleep, Michael, you're absolutely spot on. Quality of sleep is absolutely essential. And what, what most people who don't wear wearables think is they say, well, you know, I went to bed at 11 and I was up at, at 6. I got my seven hours. Well, what you don't understand is your body wakes up even though you may not even remember it. And so one of these things these wearables do is tell you really how how long you were awake. The average is usually 50 to 70 minutes during your average, you know, seven or eight hour sleep span. So you may be in bed for seven hours. It doesn't mean you were asleep for seven hours. And again, going back to the, the deep sleep and REM sleep, that's where your production is of good cells and, and deposited of bad cells really takes place. You can't do that in your, if you're in light sleep. Yeah. And, and you get your hormones get whacked out of balance. One of the interesting uh -huh. things I found when I started tracking this years ago was, um, Heart rate, just like you're saying, resting heart rate. If I got to bed, and the studies talk about this, if I got to bed before 10, really, if I got to bed even earlier, I had a lower resting heart rate than yeah. if I went to bed later, even if I slept longer, because we don't, we don't think we are, but we're all plugged in and connected. We're animals connected to the circadian rhythm of the planet. Exactly. Yeah, circadian rhythms are, are essential. And, you know, I, I'm a guy that if I'm not asleep by 10, 15, I'm, I'm going to be toast the next day. Um, and, you know, I love waking up about, you know, probably about six o'clock. And, uh, and, and even waking up is, I talk a lot about that in my book, because when you first wake up in the morning, what a first what do you usually do? You usually wake up, you usually go to the bathroom. That's the first thing. And then, you know, 90% of America, the first thing they do is go make themselves a cup of coffee. Well, when you sleep at night, you lose an average of 12 to 20 ounces of fluid during the night. You know, you perspire. And again, your body's at work. You know, everybody thinks, well, I'm sleeping. I'm not doing anything. But it, your body's still working when you're asleep. So you, you get dehydrated. So one of the things they've been doing in Japan for decades is, you know, part of the cultural things that they do is they keep a glass of water, room temperature. That's very important. So it's not cold because if you drink cold water, your body thermostat has to adjust the cold back to your body temperature. So room temperature, 12, 14 ounces down that glass of water before your, you know, before your feet even hit the, hit, hit the ground. And what that does is it rehydrates your body. It kickstarts your metabolism. It clears your brain fog. And all those dead cells, those bad guys that give you disease and everything, it cleans them out. And, you know, in Japan, they may do four or five glasses of water uh, before they start. But, I, you know, I start off baby steps. Just, just drink your 12 to 14 ounces in the morning. And I have to tell you, I get more cards, letters, phone calls about that one thing than probably anything that I preach about in the book because people go, my brain fog's gone. It's, it's totally gone. I'm, I'm more clear headed. I'm making better decisions just by drinking that water. Woohoo. I love it. I'll go, I'll go, I'll get up. I'll actually get some, some warm or hot water because I'm going to sit and meditate. My body temperature might be a little cool. I've also heard that the hot water may help, who knows, remove toxins from the liver by removing fats because it's hot. I'll drink that water and then I'll feel, <sighs> the body feels so much better. Let's go sit yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, you know, we, we're, we're essentially, our body is made up of water. So we have to constantly hydrate it. And that's one of the things we cheat ourselves up constantly. So if I go to your morning routine for a minute, where does meditation fit in? What's, what's the morning routine? Walk me through this for a minute. If yeah, you so I'll probably wake up about six o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things I like to do is wake up my body. Yeah. And, you know, again, a lot of people will jump out of bed and run to the bathroom, go back their coffee. But I like to wake up, their co uh, wake up my body because the capillaries in your body have gone to sleep, especially the capillaries at the very end of your fingers and your toes and everything else. They've kind of gone to sleep. So I will, I, I will do a, a subtle kind of stretching. I wiggle my toes. I'll wiggle my fingers. I'll, you know, I'll stretch out my hands. So I'm 
perfusing blood into those capillaries. I'll stretch, I'll roll my neck. I'll do this for about five minutes. I want my body to know I'm going to wake up and I'm going to do this in a very gentle way yeah. that, you know, the blood's perfusing and it's, it's flowing. Then I'll sit up in bed. I'll reach over, grab my glass of water, down 12, 14 ounces of water, then go to the bathroom. I don't drink coffee. I've never drank a cup of coffee in my life. Most people find that very weird, but I never have. So um, I'll go have a cup of tea. I wait about an hour, mm -hmm. and then I'll do my TM, my Transcendental Meditation, for 22 minutes. Um, it's usually in my bedroom in a dark, quiet space, uh, no noise. The curtains are pulled. And, you know, that's a, that's a profound time for me this morning. I've already, I've already meditated twice this morning already. Um, and so, uh, and, and then I'll, I'll hit the day and, um, about five days a week, I have a gym in my house. So I'll exercise. Um, I just got the new Peloton treadmill, which I absolutely Ooh. love. Not the bike, but the treadmill. It has a huge screen on it. Yep, yep. And and they have both live and pre-recorded workouts. So I can push myself. And um, you know, again, being 60 years old, I train differently than I did when I was 30. And um I, I, I'm hesitant to use the word exercise in my book because I've been influenced by too many Asian and European cultures where people, it's all about movement, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I've spoken to a lot of cardiologists about the people who were, who, who are the best people in the best shape? Are they the runners? Are they the guys that lift weights? You know, who are, and he said, you know, ironically, from an occupation standpoint, guys that are landscape architects are, are the best shape. I say, why is that? He said, well, they're constantly bending over and crouching and walking up hills and carrying buckets and doing those things. And if you look at everything from the blue zone studies to, uh, you know, European cultures, the, the people are not out there trying to run, you know, a 10K. They're just walking up hills. You know, again, I, I live in Italy three months out of the year. You may live on a five-story building that doesn't have an elevator. And so every day, maybe 10 times a day, you're walking up and down five stories. That may seem extreme to us in America, where you have to take an elevator to go to the second floor. That's just part of their lifestyle. And I, I don't mean a 30-year-old. I mean, there's 90-year-old women doing this. So I talk to people about continuous movement. You know, sitting on the couch for three hours is one of the worst things you could possibly do. So just move. And, you don't. you, you know, I, I tell people to run once a week if you're, you know, my age, just to make sure you still can and your body knows it. Um, but um, I just, I just like walking and getting eight, 10, 12, 14,000 steps in a day. I, you know, if I'm honest with your audience, I only get about 8,000 steps in a day when I'm here in, in the U S yeah. when I'm in, in Italy, I get 14. So it's that much different just in, in my daily life. Is there anything you talk about movementizing your life? I love that term. Is, is, is there anything that you do to remind yourself or is it instinctual? Sir, for instance, I'll finish this interview. I'm out for a walk or a run night now. I have to balance that yin and yang. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I wish I had your brain and I was that disciplined to do that. I have to trick myself more than anything else, yeah. you know, and it's the, it, it, one of the things that I found, um, as silly as it sounds, is cooking uh, a good meal that, you know, takes you an hour and 10 minutes to cook or something. You can get four or 5,000 steps just cooking. And again, you may say, well, geez, is that really exercise? It's not a matter, we, we have to lose that word. We have to lose the word exercise. What our body's really meant to do, we weren't born and say, okay, now you've got a Gold's Gym membership, you should go do this. We were born to move because that's the expectation of our body. So if it's cooking, if it's gardening, if it's mowing the lawn, those are all great things. And if, Michael, if you go back in time, just 50 years, yeah. look at the evolution of what we've done. Now with my iPhone, with a simple iPhone, I can order a, order a pizza, turn on my stereo, look at the best 10 restaurants in town, you know, look up what a word means on Google, you know, read a newspaper, answer my phone, whatever. Now, go back 50 years. If I wanted to look up something when I grew up and I was eight years old, I went to the encyclopedia that may have been, you know, 50 steps away and I'd pick up the A, then I'd go back to my room, do my homework. And I'm like, oh, now I got to go get the M. And I'd go back. So little things, you know, landlines, for example, my, my mom probably got a thousand steps a day answering the landline. 
Because, you know, the, our phone was always ringing. We had four kids, and she was back and forth, back and forth, hanging the clothes on the line, mowing the lawn, t walking your dog, washing your car. These are things that we don't incorporate in our daily life as much as we used to. And so I, I hear from people, you know, my dad lived to 79 years old. I know I'm going to live to 85. I'm, I, I work out three times a week. I, yeah, but your dad probably got 15,000 steps a day just living. He may not have worked out at all, so don't don't uh, don't rest on your laurels and think you get another six years because you know you go to the gym for thirty minutes three times a week. So so let's talk. Thank you so much. Let's let's talk about some other fun ways that we can incorporate exercise. And I love that you're talking about about cooking because standing is huge for your bones. And in right. fact, it's the one thing I haven't been able to wean myself off of a chair for the work I do. It's probably an excuse. I haven't figured that one out yet. But the more standing time, let alone, actually, let's go from standing and let's talk about something that's really, you're the only other person that I've heard talk about it. We have one, two, three, five minutes a day where we're stuck exactly where we're at. And it is the perfect time to do exercises or balance work, brushing yeah. our teeth. Yeah. I call them yeah. toothbrush exercises. Well, I've, I've seen too many people die because of balance. And, and let me clarify that. So the number one way, and again, I've taken care of about 60,000 elderly. The number one way that I see people go out of this world and die, and, and I would say die prematurely, even though they're 83, 84 years old, is because of lack of balance. And what happens uh, typically is a person will trip and fall because they don't have good balance. They'll fall, they'll break their hip, they'll go in the hospital, they'll be on their back for 30 days, they get pneumonia, and then they die. And so the cause of death is respiratory failure. So that's what you see, you know, when you look at the health statistics or whatever, oh, this many people die of respiratory failure. They don't keep good statistics and say, no, they really died of bad balance. That's, that's what happened. And so what I try to get people to do, and, you know, again, I, I, I'm a big guy. I'm built like a fullback. You know, I'm 5'10", 232. So I, I'm, not a, I'm a, not a dainty darling. And that's, that's almost 50 pounds lighter than I used to be. So, you know, but what I try to get people to do, even with my big flat feet, is, is stand on one foot and brush their teeth at night. If, if you're a TV watcher, then great. During a commercial break that's three minutes long, stand on one foot for a minute and a half, stand on the other foot for a minute and a half, just during the commercials. There's all kinds of things that you can do. And if you're waiting in line, stand on one foot. You know, you're wait, we wait constantly in this world. So you put that weight to good use. And if you do that, your brain will develop this mentality of balance that will help your body and it will adapt to it. Woohoo! Tell us about the big bird exercise. Well, that's the big bird exercise has to do with balance. You know, you think of the big bird and and you know how the big the big bird you know puts his foot up on the other knee. It's, it's actually a yoga position, and. Um, it's funny. I've, I've, I've taken yoga like three times now. I am the most un-yoga person there is in the universe. And so my, my yoga instructor was, do this big bird exercise. And, you know, so I, uh, I, I am, again, I'm the least likely candidate to have good balance just because I'm very chest heavy. And so, you know, if you think of a bird, how a big bird takes, you know, one foot and puts it up uh, and the leg on the other, that's, that's the, the thing that I try to do when I'm waiting or, or wasting time to get my balance better. Thank you. So when we're talking about uh, getting younger, feeling younger, what can you tell us about, uh, and you've had an interest in Qigong and getting the energy flowing. Yeah. I, you know, my wife and I are big woo-woo people. Um, she was a trauma nurse for many, many years. I've been in healthcare for 35 years. And, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time in Asia. And uh, we've just seen so many alternative medicines have a dramatic effect on people. You know, uh, you, you, we all know Emmett Oz, Dr. Oz. And I was talking to, to Emmett one day about the things that he does, uh, you know, before he even does surgery. And he does Reiki on people before he goes to surgery. He does, he does prayer for people before they go into surgery. So, you know, here's a guy, one of the most well-known physicians in the country. Um, Deepak Chopra uh, taught me meditation. Uh, and, you know, he talks about all the things that he does with people from a medical aspect. So, you know, Qigong's been around, I don't know exactly, I want to say four or 5,000 years. Um, tai Chi has been around thousands of years. And really it's about balancing ourselves 
uh, from a physical perspective and gaining strength, mm -hmm. um, but also balancing ourselves from an emotional perspective. And um, I am just such a huge believer in um, in alternative medicines. And I think our country's slow to this, America's slow to this, but it's starting to come around. Um, I, I go and see a Chinese doctor who's also an MD every week, and I, I get acupuncture from her, um, I take herbs, um, and I've been going to her for five years. And you know, this goes back to that medical crisis that I had with a bad colon and so on. I went to the Mayo Clinic and I saw four of the most brilliant physicians in the world and they said, hey, we'd like to take out 14 inches of your colon. That was seven years ago. I said, well, that sounds like a fun party. Do you mind if I take a rain check on that? And so seven years ago, and I went to this Chinese doctor and her name is Dr. Becky Sue. Mm -hmm. I swear if I could choose any doctor in the world to be on a deserted island with me to treat my health, it would be her. Because she's so well-rounded and has such great emotional medical intelligence about what's going on with you by just looking at your body and not saying this is wrong, but better yet saying if you don't change this, this is what's going to go wrong. She's ahead of the curve in terms of treating us. And she's like, okay, well, you know, I don't want you to have a heart attack, so we're going to slow your, you know, this down so, you know, you don't have this problem. So she's always given me the, the foreshadow of what's happening. And I, again, we're, we're, we're too accustomed to going into the doctor and saying, oh, this is wrong. And he's like, well, here's a pill. Take it. I want to know, you know, 30 steps before I have the problem, how I can avoid it. Well, it's, it's, it's so critical because everything compounds in our life. So, you know, a simple thing that's just a little bit off in your 20s compounds in 30s and 40s and 50s and then pop. At some point, yeah. what you're talking about is a completely different methodology of treating health rather than treating dis-ease. Yeah. And you make an interesting point about the thing, you know, how things are stacked. And um, I talk a little bit about this in my book where, uh, you know, you may have a, a – I was at a, a funeral of a guy. Oh, I don't even remember. Maybe it was four or five years ago. And he was a marathon runner. And, you know, he was – in his, in his forties and he died. And, um, they were said, God, this guy ran a marathon. How could he die? And you know, I, I don't, I don't know exactly how he died, but one of the things that happens with people is we stress the body too much. And I'll, I'll just g give out a, a false scenario. Let's say you are a marathon runner and you work and you work and you work the heart and then you get the flu. Okay. And then uh, you got a big meeting, so you kind of don't get well rested from the flu. And you go out for three days with these guys and you drink and so on. And then you come home and you feel like crap and you take some cold medicine. And then you don't wake up the next day. What, what's happened is we stack a tremendous amount on the body, mm -hmm. expecting it to stand up to it. And here's, here's the problem most of the time it does, most of the time, you will combat that and you will make it through that. But not always. And depending on your overall physical health and everything else, the body will only stress so far. It's actually very hard to kill someone because we have so many backup systems in our body that prevents that from happening. But there is a tipping point. There's a tipping point where, hey, I ran the marathon. I drank for three days. I now have the flu. I got the cold. I took this cold medicine that would be normally okay. And you've stacked too many cards on this thing and it crumbles. And that's, that's what I'm trying to educate people is to be aware. Be aware of where you are in your health journey. I, I know right now I'm, I'm pretty tired having to been to Europe and I've had a, four board meetings this week and done four radio shows. And so I'm a, I'm a little bit on the tired side. So I, I'm not going to go out and I'm not going to do a really super hard workout. I have to compensate for where my mind and body is. So – you, a lot of this is being aware of what your body is. And, you know, one of the chapters in my book is be your own best physician. Yes. We put so much trust and guidance in this guy that gives you 17 minutes, you know, in his office that may have not have seen you in two years. It's crazy. I mean, we spend more time shopping for a refrigerator than we do our, our physicians, you know? So we go in there and, and then we go, well, what's wrong with me, doctor? You should know what's wrong with you. You should know, hey, this is my baseline. My blood sugar is normally this every day. I, every day I take my blood sugar, my blood pressure. I, I look at my body temperature. I look at how much sleep I've had. So when I go to a and, doctor. And you'll even test your telomeres. 
I, I test my telomeres. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a fanatic about testing. But when I go to my doctor, I say, doctor, this is what's wrong with me. Here's my baseline. Da, 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 da. And, you know, I, and I have a concierge doctor who knows me very well. But I'm not going to allow her to waste one minute asking me the obligatory questions about, well, what's wrong? I'm going to go in there and document. So if you have a doctor that's your general doctor that you've got 17 minutes with, Make the most of that. You go in and tell him what's wrong. This is off baseline. I, my fever is not this high. I don't normally only sleep four hours, whatever it is. And so he can get to cure because you got 17 minutes. Make the use, the, the most of it. Woohoo. So, so many different directions we can go with this that I love. First off, it's a very non as non Western idea that we go in and we don't give all of our power away. This is whole white smock idea. And I guess was it your mother who would dress up well, or was it your grandmother yeah. who would dress up well? My mom. My mom could be, you know, throwing her tonsils up in the in the toilet with the flu, and and then she'd go to the doctor and she'd put on her best suit and red lipstick, and the doctor would come in. And she'd say, "Well, Colleen, how do you feel? I feel great." No, no, you don't feel great. You were just throwing <laughs> up 37 minutes ago. Tell him you feel horrible. Yeah. But she had such reverence for the doctor. She had such, you know, admiration for the doctor. The doctor was God. And the doctor was going to, you know, physically cure her by laying his, his hands on her. You know, I, I have literally dozens and dozens of friends who are doctors. And they're like, you know, we don't always know. You know we're going to make a best guess. We have great, you know, 10 years of education. We've seen, you know, maybe hundreds or thousands of people, but we don't know. We're, we're going to kind of guess what's wrong with you and what's going on. So I want to help them with their guess. I want to, I want to ed educate them on the curve of learning what's wrong with me. And so, you know, I study a lot about healthcare. I study a lot. And I, there's been times where I challenge the physician. I'm like, no, I don't think that's the best course of treatment. Here's what I think. What do you think about that? And have a dialogue with them. And I think physicians are more open to that today than they ever have been. You know, if you did that 25 years ago, they would have thrown you out of their office and said, we'll go see someone else. Now they're like, okay, I didn't think of it that way. And maybe you're right. I love it. So I want to go to a couple other areas that have to do with energy, health, and youth. With that said, my watch just interrupted me. It buzzed and says, move. Move. <laughs> oh! Woohoo! All right. So All with right. that said, let's go back to sleep for a second because I want to address one. When we talk about stacking, this popped for me. Sleeping pills. Yeah. You know, I guess a guy that you do travel a lot internationally. I used to take Ambien, and uh, about four years ago, I stopped taking it. And um, one, it, it, it did a horrible effect on my on my uh, circadian rhythms. Um, two, it created brain fog over the top all day long. But three, there's some preliminary research that sleeping pills may actually advance dementia, memory loss, and Alzheimer's. Um, I don't want to take that chance. It's just not worth it. And I think there's other things that you can do, you know, melatonin and things like that, that can help you, you know, get a good night's sleep without taking a prescription drug. Thank you. Since we're talking about dementia and Alzheimer's, it brings up the perfect next point. It, you talk about the, what is it? The Western crack is sugar. Oh man, I, I tell you, this this is a battle that that I still fight because it's everywhere. And as a guy that has a propensity to put on weight when he's staring at a cake on television, <laughs> um, you, you know, I, I have to fight this battle. And my family's plagued with diabetes. My son's a type one. I have siblings that are type two. Uh, my dad was a type two. I mean, so it it is everywhere. And the problem with it is. We have become such a society that's that's you know it's it's the crack of our time, and you know if you go back in time, um, you know in 1800 we only ate about five to seven pounds of sugar, and then in 1900 in we a year, ate, yeah, in a year. I'm sorry, yeah, in a year. In in 1900, um, you know we ate about 35 pounds of sugar in a year. Today we eat a full size human being sugar. We eat 150, 160 pounds of sugar in a year. And you may say, "Why well, don't eat candy bars?" Okay, well, if you're eating bread, if you're eating pasta, if you're eating potatoes, if you're eating rice, you're eating sugar. And sugar is so hidden in everything. So you know, look look in the first three ingredients of anything you eat. Is it does it say fructose, corn syrup, you know, whatever? Um, but sugar is probably in it. So. Uh, 
what I did, one of the reasons that I, I lost almost 50 pounds is the first time I just said, I'm not doing sugar in any form for 30 days. And I lost about 16, 17 pounds in 30 days. And all I did was say, hey, I'm not, just not going to do sugar. And and it was in the first four or five days that you go off of it, you feel like you're it's a drug withdrawal. I mean, it is a drug, right? So you're cranky, you don't sleep well, you feel like you have the flu. And then about day four, day five, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I feel great. So we got to get this out of our system. I, you know, I, I think I say in the book, if I was elected president, I, I would put mandates on sugar because it's really killing us. And the obesity uh, craze is, is, is huge. So thank you for sharing on that. Going back to pills one more time. Don't mean to be picking on meds today, although there may be yeah. other ways for doing all of this. But there's a time and a place. There is a time and a place for everything. But let's talk about, and this, this may have been a, a, a contr contributing factor to you going in the hospital, uh, things like Prilosec and antacids and taking stuff like this on a regular basis and how it affects our gut health. Yeah. You know, I went down to a longevity center in Marin County called the Buck Center. And um, it's a huge place uh, that they've done longevity research for years and years and years. Very impressive uh, institute. And they focused entire research on gut health and, you know, the, the amount, of, amount of probiotics that are in there, the amount of bacteria that's in there, the balance of those things. And because really our gut is the regulator for nutrient health, right? And so it's, it's, it's how you dispel certain nutrients in, in your bodies. Um, that's, that's really important. And what some of these medications that you do, I used to be on Prilosec, um, and it, it ruins the, all the, all the, the good gut bacteria that you have in your health. Your, your, your gut is supposed to have a certain amount of acid. Now, you know, uh, acid that's that's productive that helps you break down the foods in a reasonable way that helps you get the nutrients and the vitamins that you need when we put these other medications in ourselves we disrupt the natural flow of our body and that's and there's some again prilosex a, a drug that people are looking at too for for issues that may cause memory disorders and so on thank you what's the importance of friends and what in the world's a laughter club Oh, you know, I'm going to take this two different directions. Right. Um, last Friday, I had uh, lunch. It's going to sound like I'm bragging here a little bit. I, I had lunch with Bill and Hillary Clinton. And I mean, I, I, I sat, Hillary was on my left and Bill was on my left or right. And I sat, talked to him for two and a half hours. And one of the studies that I embarked on when I was writing this book is I studied the United States presidents. And I looked at them and I said, um, why are these guys living so long? Why is Jimmy Carter 93, 94 years old and he's building houses for humanity, um, Habitat for Humanity? And, and you know, even uh, George Bush that just died, why, why, is, why was he in his 90s doing you know, things and 85 jumping out of airplanes? And if you look at, at their birth times and how long they were supposed to live, they were outliving their natural cohort of, by their birthday by 10 or 15 years. And, you know, Johnson was one exception. He had a heart attack in his 60s. Mm -hmm. um, but I looked at this and said, well, stress is such a big deal and it's killing us. Why is the most stressful job in the world allowing these guys to live 15 years, 20 years beyond their natural longevity cohort based on their on their birthday? So I talked to President Clinton about this and I knew I knew the answer. I knew my answer. Yeah. And I said, tell me why. And, you know, he said a couple of things to me. He said, you know, most of the males in his family had not lived into their 60s, that they had serious health crises and died before. And he's he's almost 73 now. And he said, Dwayne, I think for presidents, um, one of the things is that we have such a vibrant social life, but we have purpose in our life. And purpose is incredibly important in driving us. Now, here's the other thing that I didn't tell him before I asked the question. I told him later. Vice presidents, on the other hand, were not living as long. In fact, several of the vice presidents were not living as long as their average birth date cohorts that they were born in the same time with. And as we talked about that, it was that people were not getting the satisfaction of the office that presidents were getting. They were not making the impact. So that that's one thing. The, the second thing I would tell you is Harvard University probably has the longest longevity study running. I think it's 75 or 80 years long. 
And they studied everything to look at longevity. They started genetics. They started exercise. They started nutrition. They started all these things. What they found was the number one thing was that people who were married at the age of 50 were living seven in a happy marriage, happy marriage at the age of 50, just not a marriage, happy marriage, were living seven to 10 years longer than those who were not married or in an unpleasant marriage. So going back to relationships and friends and all those things, very, very important. The last thing I'll say on this, Michael, um, is that one of the things my wife and I have gone to do as we see people who are aging is that um, we know that when you when you age with your friends for 20, 30 years, one of the conversations tends to be, oh, I had my heart replacement. I had my valve replaced. I had, you know, my gallstones taken out. And this becomes your daily conversation with people. So you're kind of programming your brain as to this is my life. So we've adopted and made a conscious effort to have friends that are 15 to 20 years younger than us. It does two things. One, the dialogue and the conversations you have with these people are totally different. The second thing it does is my mother-in-law is 83 and she says every week I go to a funeral. And so, you know, it, it sets up a dynamic where you're doing things that stretch your age bracket. We, we went out with a friend of mine who's a Hollywood actor. And he had us out till 2.30 in the morning going to these restaurants and clubs and stuff. My wife looked at me and she said, what? And we're walking down the street at 2.30 in the morning. She said, when's the last time we've done this? And I go, I don't know, but it feels good to do this at 60 years old. So, you know, having friends that are 15 or 20 years younger are going to make you live longer as well. Awesome. And and that gets to, and it's 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 really, we're gonna, time-wise, it's tight to, to fit much in on this, but it gets to the heart of the matter, which is, yes, there are there is a biological component. Yes, there is a genetic component, but so much of this is not as it appears to be. If we get stuck thinking, well, I have to talk about my replacement knee or my this or my that, we are going to age. If instead we start talking about how we're hanging with the kids, how we want to go climb Rainier or whatever yeah. it is, that's going to take place as well. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, that you again, you're programming your brain as to what you, you want to be. And I tell people, don't don't early age yourself. Don't don't think, oh, I'm this age, so I have to do this. I'm this age, so I can only move this way. I'm this age, so I can't do that anymore. Don't you know? Don't early age yourself. I I, I tell people, if you can't do it, the big guy upstairs will let you know, and you won't even know it. So. My mentor, who passed away at 93 and a half years young, he actually he was my best man at 89 years young. He would always wow. try to beat the women because he wanted to impress them at the Boulder Boulder, the 60-year-old women when he was in his mid-80s, almost up to 90. He retired wow. from driving the nursing home bus, driving the, quote, youngsters at 93. Wow. Incredible. So he Incredible. said his words were for guys, because women are more social, for guys, this is his opinion, um, if a guy retires and doesn't have a purpose, they're gone within six months. Yeah. Well, we have it all wrong in America. We think we're going to work to 63, 64, 65. We're going to move to Arizona. We're going to golf all day. Those people, and there's good science behind those, those people die early. They, because they don't have purpose that, you know, getting your golf score from an 87 to an 84 is not purpose. So, you know, that's why these presidents, you know, are living so long. Remember the 60 minutes crew with Morley Safer and Mike Wallace, yep. they, they were out in the street doing things, do, doing international war coverage at 83 years of age. So purpose, that desire, that's what gets you out of bed in the morning. It gives you purpose in life to move on. Thank you. If you were to give people three key steps that they can begin today to start getting younger, what would they be? Well, I, re I really believe in the hydration thing. So, uh, you know, the water. I, I really believe that you have to move. I mean, if you're not getting at least, if, you know, what I found in talking to uh, everything from scientists to exercise people, if you're not moving 5,000 steps a day, your body will actually start to rot. It would deteriorate. So if you look at your Fitbit and you're like, oh, I'm going to bed and it's got 3,900 steps, Get your rear end out there and at least get a couple more thousand steps before you go to bed. Don't run. Don't exercise because that won't help your sleep. But but make sure you're getting that time in. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think sleep is the thing that you have to do. You have to get good sleep. You know, sleep is just essential for you. And, you know, and I'm a big meditation uh, proponent. When I don't get good sleep, 
Um, I'll try to meditate and that, that'll make me feel like I get an extra hour of sleep through meditation. I love it. So we got to wrap things up so we can get into a brief meditation. Before we do that, since you mentioned steps, I've got to ask your opinion on this. Having 60,000 people under your belt, so to speak, how do you feel about one of my all-time favorite training tools, stairs? Oh, I love stairs. I, again, I think in Europe, that's what keeps people alive. Um, I, I have a home in Italy that's on the Spanish steps. And I run up and down the Spanish steps whenever I can. There's, I think, 172 steps going, yeah. going up and down the Spanish steps. So that's one of my favorite training tools. I don't, I don't do it five times a week. I maybe do it once. But so if somebody tells you I'm starting to get sore knees, sore this, sore that, I'm thinking of going to a ranch so that I don't have to deal with stairs. What's your first reaction? I think that's the first uh, first step in a slippery slope. No pun intended. I, I think, you know, you, you obviously want to be careful and guard your health and not ruin your cartilage and everything else. But when you start to give up stuff is when you start to decline. Thank you. Thank you. So where can people go to find your, I'm going to call it fascinating. It's not just a, a beautiful book, but it's fascinating because you start to think about your life and getting younger, feeling younger is really about the lifestyle choices that yeah. we make. Well, my book is coming out uh, Labor Day, so you, you got the preview version, so we're, it'll be out the 1st of September. Uh, 30 Summers More is the name of the book. Um, you can go to my website, Dwayne, D-W-A-Y-N-E, J, just the letter, Clark, without an E, C-L-A-R-K, and that's my website, so Dwayne J. Clark, and uh, send me any comments or questions or information. I'd love to hear from you, and the book will be sold on Amazon uh, come this summer. And it's also going to be carried in Hudson's bookstores in airports. Awesome. So if you didn't catch DwayneJClark.com, come on over to InspireNationShow.com. We'll get you over to DwayneJClark.com. Two last questions. We'll jump into the meditation. First off, what advice would you give parents for their kids to set them up? Because why not start at the earliest age? Yeah, I think education is the best key. Um, I have nine grandchildren, two children and nine grandchildren. I often say they have no other hobbies other than having children. But, um, you know, uh, we have a nutritionist that we bring in and do talks to our kids um, as at early as the age of five wow. so that they give uh, they make good choices. And they they know when they make bad choices. And one of the things we don't prevent them from making bad choices. But one of the things that we ask them is like, let's say they eat two cupcakes. OK. And then we, we wait about 20 minutes and we say, how do you how does your body feel now? And that may sound almost silly or, you know, like, well, who cares? But we want them to recognize cause and effect. We want them to say, oh, I feel kind of dizzy or lightheaded or my eyes are going goofy or whatever. And we want to say, well, that that's the effect that you have of eating two cupcakes. And it's, your body's hurting right now. So just learning that cause and effect in education is critically important. Very, very cool. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people, Dwayne? Well, I just say, you know, don't pre-age yourself. I mean, there's nothing you can't do. Um, and we live in the information age. I mean, if you, you want to find something out about your medical, your health, your whatever, I mean, everyone from the Mayo Clinic to the Cleveland Clinic to Harvard Medical School, you can go on and find out stuff about what's going on with yourself. So don't don't be lazy. This is the only body you're getting this time around. So make make use of it and, and treat it well and, and make it be your sanctuary. Woohoo! This has been awesome, Dwayne. I can't thank you enough. Would you have time then for meditation? Yeah, yeah, let's do a quick five-minute meditation, and then we'll sign off. So um, what I'd like everybody to do is find a comfortable spot. Um, hopefully that's a chair, a dark place, not something with a lot of noise around it. I'll and pause then for sit. one second. If you're driving, pull over or do this later. Yeah, yeah. Please don't close your eyes if you're driving. So, um, And then just get in a real comfortable space. And uh, close your eyes, if you will. And what I want you to do is I want you to feel your body. So to do that, I want you to, to take a deep breath, the first one with me. And what I want you to do is I want you to give your body a little bit of audience here for the next few seconds. And what I mean by that, I'm just going to ask your body, what pains you? So often we're too busy in our own lives to listen to our body and its own pain. So I'm going to ask this question and just answer in silence. Body, what pains you? Another deep breath. 
And your body's going to come up with a variety of things that's paining it. It may be you have a hangnail that's sore. It may be your right knee is bothering you. It may be that your stomach's not feeling good. Maybe your neck has a crick in it. Let your body tell you what pains you and acknowledge that as your body says, this is what pains me. And let your body take that in. And let's just take a few seconds in silence for you to keep asking that question. Be mindful of what your body tells you because some of these things may surprise you. Keep asking, body, what pains you? Keep your breathing going. Try to keep your posture somewhat straight. And just a couple more seconds of asking your body what pains you. All right, so keep a mental note of what your body's told you. Keep your eyes closed. And now what I want you to do is I want you to get inside your body. And this may sound a little bit silly, but I want you to feel your body and we're gonna work our way up our body. So the first thing I want you to do is in the tips of your toes, I want you to focus on your very tips of your toes and see if you can feel your pulse in the tips of your toes. So focus, focus on the tips of your toes and see if you can feel your heartbeat in the tips of your toes. It may take you a few seconds, but feel that, focus on it. See if you can feel the heartbeat. Just be conscious, this is your life force, this is your energy, this is your chi that's flowing through your body and bring it all the way down to the tips of your toes. I can feel mine now, can you feel yours? All right, now let's move up and put your index finger and your thumb together. And the same thing that we're gonna do here is we're gonna have our, feel the pulse between that index finger and that thumb on both hands. And just focus on that. Focus on the heartbeat in that. It'll take you a couple seconds to get in connection with it. Get in connection with the rhythm of your heart. And you'll start to feel You'll start to feel the rhythm and the pulse in your forefinger and your thumb. You'll start to feel it beating. Okay. And now I want you to take both of your hands and place them over your heart. So take both of your hands and put them on your chest. Breathe in real deep. And I want you just to stare into your mind's eye and stare into the blackness. And every once in a while, there's going to be a thought that comes into your mind. Just let it pass like a fish passing in an aquarium. Your mind's busy. This is the busy part of your day. Just let that thought pass like a fish passing by an aquarium until your mind sees nothing but black. When you reach blackness, you know that you've reached a state of peace. One more big breath. All right, now slowly open your eyes. Maybe stretch a little bit and come back. And I thank you. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> All right, Michael. All thank right. Thank you so much, Dwayne. This has been so much fun. It's my friend. Thank you so much. Thank you, my friend. Blessings to you. All right. Blessings to you thank as well. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get 30 summers more, and begin getting younger today and shine bright. Thanks, Michael.
Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also leave your comments, have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're gonna get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>